TV Spotlight, Sons and Daughters. Sons and Daughters is an Australia television soap opera that ran for six seasons from 1982 to 1987. Despite being almost three decades since it went off air the series maintains a strong cult following and you can count me in as one of that cult. I have to be honest, I am not a fan at all of modern soap operas, and have not watched any for many a year, but I've always had a liking for many of the 80s and even early 90s soap operas such as 80s and early 90s Neighbours, 80s Home and Away and E Street. Sons and Daughters, however, is the daddy of them all. Originally I was a kid when this show was on in the UK and only saw it during school holidays but I eventually got so hooked on it I started getting my mum to tape it for me so I could rush home from school and watch it. Ah, happy days. When Sons and Daughters began in 1982, it focused primarily on two families, the Hamiltons and the Palmers. The Hamilton family is a wealthy, upper-class family living in an affluent area of New South Wales and consists of Gordon, played by Brian Blaine, and Patricia, played by Rowena Wallace and their children Angela, played by Ali Fowler, and Ween, played by Ian Rawlings. The Palmer family are a working-class family living in a dinny Melbourne suburb and consists of David, played by Tom Richards, and Beryl, played by Layla Hayes and their three children, eldest son John, played by Peter Phelps, daughter Susan, played by Anne Lawrence, and teenage son Kevin, played by Stephen Cummy. The two families appear to have precisely zero in common, but are linked by a family secret and a youthful relationship between David and Patricia. The other major characters at the start of Sons and Daughters are Fiery Batleek's Fiona Thompson, played with memorable theatrical relish by Bate MacDonald, who has connections to both families and her lodger and close friend Gil Taylor, played by Kim Lewis, who has secrets of her own. Sons and Daughters began as it meant to go on with a dramatic and sensational storyline in which John is accused of a murder he did not commit. Terrified of being falsely convicted, John does what any decent law-abiding citizen would do and gets the hell out of there. In fact, he flees to Sydney, where he has a chance encounter with Angela, a chance encounter that sees sparks fly and the beginning of a new romance. Unfortunately for both of them, this is not going to be a happy scenario because the secret that connects the families is that John and Angela are actually brother and sister, twins in point of fact. This storyline needless to say gets the show off to a ripper and compulsive beginning. The show's most infamous and iconic character is almost certainly Patricia, the soap bitch to end all soap bitches. Rowena Wallace is blistering in the role, and won a number of Australian TV Logie Awards for her performance. She's not just a catty cow, there's an incredible intensity and venom in her performance, as well as a rather unhinged, almost psychotic quality that the writers clearly took note of given that Patricia would struggle with mental health issues at some later points. Not for nothing does the Australian media still refer to her character by the nickname Pate the Rat. Over the course of the six years, of course, many characters leave and many new ones arrive, and by the end of the series the only original regular characters are Gordon, Beryl, Wayne, and Fiona. Many of the replacement characters are excellent, however, including Barbara, played by Cornelia Francis, who is an occasional character in the first season who becomes a regular in later seasons and actually marries Gordon after he finally wises up and ditches Pate Sass, and Charlie Bartlett, a ditzy and delightfully flighty airhead played by the wonderful Sarah Kemp, who seems to be about the only real friend Patricia actually has, which is rather strange given the amount of put-downs Pat often sends her way. Other memorable characters include one of my favorites, Lee Palmer, played by Lisa Cretenden. Lee's story plays out in just 12 months and yet it is one of the saddest story arcs in the show. Upon introduction, Lee seems like a total bitch, a nice cold cow who might almost be a junior Patricia. But there's a reason why Lee has adopted this persona, and when you find out what it is, it is, to be blunt, pretty bloody horrifying and explains a great deal. Over the course of the year, 
being around people who care about her including David and, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly, Charlie, begins to rub off on her and the nice, sweet, vulnerable girl hiding behind the mask of a monster begins to peek out. The transformation does not happen overnight, but it does happen, and eventually Lee is unrecognizable as the rather horrible person she was upon arrival and even finds love with policeman Adam, who is Charlie's son. But then the hammer comes down, and the absolute worst thing she did while being the crazy bitch comes back to bite her in the ass in a big way, leading to an ultimately tragic climax to her story. It's heartbreaking stuff. The show also had some fantastic guest villains, the top three of whom are probably Roger Carlyle, played by Leigh Damon, who later went on to play the crusty but decent Sergeant George Sullivan in E Street, bitch queen businesswoman Karen Fox, played by Lyndall Rowe, and Dr. Ross Newman, played by Robin Stewart. Roger Carlyle is a ruthless businessman and sleaze Paul with a taste for much, much, much younger women who initially seems more of a sleaze than a real threat. But all that changes when his son is murdered and Patricia is erroneously arrested for the crime. Roger is convinced of her guilt and will stop at nothing to kill her before she even gets to trial. Karen Fox is probably the show's last great tuba bitch who gives Patricia a run for her money but who is one seriously twisted puppy. Perhaps her most horrendous actions involve Wayne, with whom she becomes romantically involved. Wayne soon starts to lose interest but let's just say the scheme that Karen comes up with to insert Wayne and ensure he'll never leave her is as screwed up and sick in the head as you could possibly get. Possibly the best of all however is the evil Dr. Ross Newman. A silver-tongued, uber-smooth charmer, Newman is also a gambling addict in perpetual desperate need of money, and he will do anything, and I do mean anything, to get it. He is introduced to the show working for Roger Carlyle, where he tries to send Patricia insane by giving her the wrong medication and then tries to kill her on the operating table. Even when that storyline ends however, Newman remains on the show and his schemes get ever more twisted. First he takes advantage of a vulnerable Barbara, getting her hooked on prescription medicine while seducing her with his silver tongue, all the while two-timing her with a much younger woman and planning to fleece her of all her money. When young Andy becomes suspicious, he frames him by planting illegal drugs in his van. His final desperate act is perhaps his most despicable, as he kidnaps Beryl's newborn baby boy in order to hold him for ransom. All in all, the dastardly Dr. Newman was a first class, a great bastard and a fantastic guest villain. All this and I haven't even really talked about my favorite character much yet. Although Patricia is arguably the show's most famous character, and she is fantastic. She left the show after just three years. My favorite character is one who is the from beginning to end. I'm talking, of course, about the wonderful Wayne Hamilton. Wayne is a screwed up rich kid with a massive chip on his shoulder, played fantastically by Ian Rawlings. Rawlings is probably better known to a different generation as pot-bellied family man and all-round nice guy Phil Martin on 90s Neighbors, but to me he will always be the scheming, smirking and hilariously manipulative Wayne. Wayne is a villain it's almost impossible not just to love, but to actually root for and hope he succeeds in his crazy schemes much of the time. Part of this is down to Rawlings, who is likable even being an absolute bastard, and whose trademark smirks when things go his way are the stuff of legend. I used to practice trying to do a smirk like that in the mirror for hours when I was a kid. Well, alright, seconds maybe, but you get the idea. Wayne was my childhood hero, which is pretty disturbing when you think about it. If Wayne is screwed up, he has good reason. If having Patricia as a stepmom and role model wasn't bad enough, he also has a seriously messed up relationship with his father. Although Gordon is depicted as a likable, warm and gentlemanly character in every other respect, his treatment of Wayne in his childhood was appalling. Wayne's mother died in childbirth with him, 
and Gordon basically blamed Wayne and took it out on him for most of his childhood and adolescence, ignoring and shunning him and ultimately leaving him with a giant-sized insecurity complex that is the root of much of Wayne's behavior. Indeed, it is startling how much of Wayne's manipulations are really about trying to win the affection and approval of others. He just has no idea how to go about doing this other than following Patricia's example, plotting and scheming. He is almost pathetically desperate for his father's approval and when his schemes aren't some twisted way of getting that, they're about winning the affections of women he has genuine feelings for, such as Jill and later, Susan, brought back to the series in 1986 played by a different actress, the rather wonderful and rather wonderfully named Oriana Panuzzo. This need for validation is another reason it's hard to hate him, as is the fact that many of his schemes are so overcomplicated and gobsmackingly convoluted that they're frequently hilarious. Another reason why I tend to root for this villain is down to the fact that he is almost an underdog due to the way he's treated by the other characters. Because, to be blunt, most of them treat him like shit. There's a fundamental disconnect between how other characters are treated and how Wayne is treated by those around him. Other, supposedly good characters including his sister Angela, can behave in appalling, selfish, cruel and mean-spirited ways. Yet they are always forgiven for their transgressions. Wayne, on the other hand, is offered no such forgiveness or understanding. Even when he's genuinely trying to change and be a better man he gets nothing but derision. Even Terry Hansen, who is introduced when he brutally and cold-bloodedly rapes Jill, a woman he's just met, ultimately gets treated with more understanding and forgiveness than is ever displayed to Wayne. Wayne himself pointed this disconnect out in one memorable scene where he verbally attacked Gordon and Barbara and a number of other characters, noting that they want to pick and choose the rules they and those they favor have to play with, and denouncing them as a bunch of hypocrites. It's difficult to argue that he isn't entirely right. In one storyline Wayne is, charmingly, suspected of being the serial rapist who is terrorizing the rural community of Mumbai. Of course, not only is Wayne innocent, but in the climax of this story he even gets to be the hero and rescue a teenage girl from experiencing a similar fate at the hands of the real attacker. The other characters who and hover him for about five minutes, and then immediately go back to treating him like shit again. Wayne has a number of fantastic storylines in the early years, too many to list here, though perhaps the most utterly unhinged occurs in 1985. This story is so OTT it shouldn't work at all, and yet it's sparkingly brilliant. The setup is that Wayne is suspected of murder, and like John and Patricia before him, Wayne decides he's not sticking around to get fitted up for something he didn't do and takes off. The problem is, that even when the real killer confesses, his family have no way of contacting him to let him know it's safe to come home. Being the filthy rich sods they are, the Hamiltons take out full-page ads, including his photo, in every national newspaper. Unfortunately one ad is seen not by Wayne but by Gary Evans, a man who just happens to be Wayne's identical doppelganger, and thus obviously also played by Ian Rawlings. Gary rocks up at the Hamilton house, claiming to conveniently have amnesia, and very soon the Hamiltons have their very own cuckoo in the nest. This storyline is batshit insane but brilliant, helped enormously by Ian Rawlings' performance, who really succeeds in making Gary seem like a very different character to Wayne and even, rather oddly, a much more physically intimidating one. The setup for the climax to this story comes when Wayne finally comes home just as Gary's took off and, rather than getting the rousing welcome home he was expecting, instead finds himself in an episode of the Twilight Zone and accused of a number of horrendous things, including ripping off his father's company in the last few months when he knows full well he hasn't been there for the last few months. Absolutely batshit crazy but brilliant. To be continued.